So when we talk about a post-corona era, I fear that many of you can glimpse that world more clearly than I can. However, I would like to offer a few of my own thoughts about geopolitics and the international order in the post-coronavirus era. First is that historically, cataclysms can be a strategic accelerator. The great Japan scholar, Dr. Kenneth Pyle from the University of Washington, recently reminded me of the work of the great British historian, A.J.P. Taylor, who is fascinated by times when forces beyond the control of humanity fundamentally and inescapably shapes our world. While some believe that these forces randomize the world's geopolitics, I would argue that historically, global cataclysms tend to accelerate pre-existing trends. For example, both World War I and World War II accelerated the rise of the United States to superpower status, while the Opium Wars accelerated the disintegration of the Qing Dynasty and hastened the rise of Imperial Japan. Similarly, I expect the coronavirus pandemic to accelerate what we saw coming before, such as worsening impacts of climate change, deepening economic inequalities, both domestically and internationally, and rising nationalism. But today I will focus on the three factors I expect to have been accelerated that will be of the greatest consequence for the geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific. First, that the pandemic has intensified uncertainties about the United States. There's nothing fundamentally new about adversaries and friends in the Indo-Pacific having questions about American engagement in the region. Geography makes such questions natural, but as we've learned over the decades, manageable. Yet those questions have grown louder in the wake of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and the 2008 financial crisis. They've skyrocketed during the Trump administration. This I think is understandable considering President Trump's oft-repeated skepticism about the utility of US alliances, his closeness and support of illiberal regimes, and his admiration's abdication of international leadership. The one question I've heard the most from Asian friends for nearly four years is if President Trump remarks a sharp break for the United States and its traditional role as an international leader, or if his administration more of an anomaly. My honest answer is I don't know, but polling of the American public shows consistent support for engagement with the world, to support our allies, to engage in trade and international investment, and to lead against foreign challenges. But just more importantly, just as importantly, polling across Asia has consistently shown that while most of the publics in the Indo-Pacific lack confidence in President Trump and oppose many of his policies, the United States still receives tremendous amounts of support across the region. The United States is still poised to lead, and no other country has the power or credibility to play that role. But leadership is a choice. The second point I would make is that China has lost a great deal of international credibility, but it has also grown emboldened and more aggressive. Again, although this trend did not begin with COVID-19, the pandemic has certainly accelerated instances of Chinese aggression, demonstrated an even greater tolerance uh, for international risk and condemnation. In April of this year, it was reported that the China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations, or Kicker, had warned China's leaders that the COVID-19 pandemic would generate a wave of hostility toward China and could drive US-China relations into confrontation. Yet I fear this warning went unheeded by Zhang Nanhai, as we have seen China undertake a series of aggressive actions since the outbreak was under control within its own borders. Beijing's efforts to cast China as a new leader in global health with its so-called mask diplomacy were undermined by its own lack of transparency about the origins of the pandemic and its failure to contain its spread, with millions around the world paying the price. Since then, China's diplomats have adopted a new wolf warrior attitude that saw normally restrained diplomats adopting an aggressive, insulting style of engagement. China has intensified pressure with India, Japan, Taiwan, Australia, and across the South China Sea. Beijing has also violated its agreements with the United Kingdom and its own One China principle by tightening its grip over Hong Kong and has continued to commit egregious violations of human rights of the Muslim Uyghur minority in Xinjiang. What the Trump administration has labeled as a campaign of mass detention and what former Vice President Biden has called genocide. It is unclear to me why the CCP seems to have abandoned its past commitments to maintaining a stable external environment. I expect there's a mix of traditional Chinese opportunism at play, but more fundamentally, I agree with others who have argued 
that these actions represent a more fundamental shift in China's approach to foreign affairs. To my mind, these actions have reinforced skepticism across the region about Chinese ambitions for regional leadership. I agree with my friends and colleagues, Dr. Kurt Campbell and Dr. Mira Rapp Hooper, who wrote recently, quote, by leaving a power vacuum in the world's darkest hour, the United States has bequeathed China ample room to overreach and to demonstrate that it is unqualified for a position of sole global leadership. The third point I would make is that US-China competition will likely deepen in the future. Regardless of who wins the next US presidential election, I expect that relations between Washington and Beijing will continue to be driven by competition. While I hope that opportunities for cooperation towards areas of mutual interest can be utilized, I fear that competition may eventually give way to confrontation, crisis, and conflict. I'm especially concerned about the implications of Chinese assertiveness related to US allies and partners, as well as other fundamental interests of the United States as this has the greatest potential to bring about the scenario that we all fear. So looking ahead, I expect that at some point, the United States will return to its traditional role of leadership in the international community. But I also expect that the international environment will have changed significantly when that time comes. I fear that the international liberal order, without American leadership and without strong US alliances and partnerships, may eventually wither away bringing a world that is less prosperous, less stable, and more atomized. To avoid these challenges, the United States must rebuild its, the roots of American power, revitalize our regional alliances and partnerships, and recommit to the principles of the foundation of American leadership and, and liberal, the liberal international order. As a region, I would argue we need two qualities in far greater abundance. The first is knowledge, which is why this forum is so important. We need more knowledge to address the challenges we face as a world, climate change, economic inequality, conflict, oppression, and ways to secure our rights, liberties, and privacy in an interconnected world. But the second, and to my mind, even more valuable uh, characteristic that we need is wisdom. Wisdom to know the difference between information and disinformation. Wisdom to turn away from a path that leads to confrontation and conflict. And wisdom to make the choice to lead and to remain true to our core principles, no matter how difficult that may be. Thank you all very much, and my best wishes to, this, to the forum. The World Knowledge Forum.